So let's get started with painting in Painter. Now we already set everything up, so let's uh, get to it. The first thing we're going to be doing is getting in all the reds. And we're going to be doing that where, you know, there is the most red, which would be the lips as a starting point. Then we're going to have some around the eyes and then on the nose and ears as well. We're starting off with red just because this is the most prominent color. We have this really nice beige skin color, but uh, we, we really have to get a lot of variation into it. People seem to assume that skin is really just this skin color, like we talked about in the last chapter, but in reality, there is so much variation. And there is so much blood under the skin as well, kind of, you know, by definition, because it's it's above the blood. So um, really, really good idea. This is starting off with blocking in the reds. And a lot of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the color that we'll be painting is just going to be red and variations of red. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do, you can really do most of, of this entire this entire series just with like four fillers like red kind of yellowish blue and then maybe some greens and some slight variation there and this is the cool the cool thing about this approach here where we're using fill layers instead of um, instead of painting it all by regular layers because we we only need this shade of red we don't have to start breaking this up and it just means we only have to paint in black and white essentially saying is the red is it you do have red here or do you not have red here this is really why I like using fill layers instead of paint layers. You know, I, I didn't really know about this approach until I started doing texturing myself. And once I got properly into fill layers, it just made uh, my workflow so much easier. Because it, it takes away a lot of the guesswork and you can always go back and adjust everything afterwards. Like you don't have to commit to this red color. You could yeah. always go in and change it super easily. The cool thing as well is once you get more into production as well and you have UVs and all that kind of stuff, the, everything is going to change after a while. Obviously, this tutorial here is not very much about production, but it means though it the only thing you would have to change here would be the mask and the redness would, would, be, would stay the same. There's a lot of red around the eyes as well. Yeah, and the only way to really get proper textures here is just to look at reference. Yeah. Yeah, we keep stressing this every one of our videos. But, I mean, before before we got to this result, I mean, this wasn't the first time we painted this texture. There were a fair few times where, you know, we, we just went through and did like a test run. And then also just looking at the at the pure color of it as well, uh, that, that's really helpful. Because a lot of times you'll see that, Ah, it looks pretty good in the 3D viewport with in the material view, but then you start looking into the individual texture and seeing that it's incredibly rough. And even though it might work well in the material view, it if you can go into the painted view, into each channel and just refine each channel, everything is just going to work better based on that. You know, one thing that I found, and I still don't know how to solve it, is that there's always some background lighting or something that's ha that's happening mm. inside a painter. So the representation in your material view, it, while it might be good, is not completely accurate. Yeah. So if you want to figure out, okay, what exactly does my you know diffuse slot look like, then going into the base color and just checking it there is the is your best bet. Also, you're seeing exactly what we're <laughs> seeing now because you can't actually just the lighting up and down. You can only just the side to side. So if you want to if you want to see like the bottom of his chin or in, in this case, you could maybe see something, but there are times where it's perfectly 90 degrees and it's 100% black. You just have to paint like this. Yeah, once you have enough, you know, detail in here in terms of color, you've got some spec on top and all that stuff, different color variation, you can actually paint a lot of it in a view like this because you don't need all the lighting information. Yeah, exactly. And the brush we're using now is also quite nice. There are, you know, we went through this in the last chapter, which brushes we're using, and you only really need a few of them. And also, like we, we, we keep talking about in our videos, like the specific brush you're using isn't that important. What's more important is your understanding of color theory. Like as long as you have a brush which you're somehow comfortable using for painting, then it, you can paint this with any brush you want to. Yeah, the advantage of using a grunge brush like this compared to a soft one is just that it gives us a little bit more texture. But you could go through and paint this with a soft brush yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. And you can also go over it afterwards with like a procedural to add a lot of variation for it. Mm. And this also depends on um, what kind of character you're doing. This is one of the core things. Like if you're painting a baby, 
which has the smoothest skin in the world versus painting this old, slightly evil man. Yeah. Like, what? how would you treat that? Well, you've got to treat it differently on, like, a fundamental level. If you're painting something really appealing and soft, you need to just use soft brushes. And then with a teeny tiny bit of variation on top. But if you're painting something old like this, which probably has a lot of wear and tear on the skin, sun damage, it's been out for ages, maybe a lot of cold, whatever it might be, there's just a lot more contrast. That's actually an interesting point you made before with the procedural on top. Because what you could do is like you have your fill layer with your paint, your mask and stuff. And then on top of that, put like a generator or something on yeah. top. So you could totally paint this with a complete soft brush and then procedurally add the little variation that we're adding here. Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of smart ways of painting skin in, mm. uh, in Painter as well. I'm sure there are some ways for you just paint some very simple masks around like some soft brushes, then you break it up with like a warp warp filter and then you just add generators. That's oh. the crazy thing about Painter, I you know. Painter. Yeah, already now you can see there's a lot more life into it. And this is like five minutes of, of real-time painting so far. <laughs> so it's it's quite simple. And again, just keep your references handy. Look at like, oh, you know, for this particular example, you would probably look at drunk people or people who've been drinking all their lives, yeah. sailors who have has a lot of sun damage in their skin. And also we're painting with symmetry because why wouldn't you? In the beginning at least, uh, I highly recommend painting with symmetry because now it's not about the subtle variations. Now it's just about, is the eye red? Yes <laughs> or no? Is the nose red? And then you go in and you break it up afterwards, which is, which is really nice. You yeah. can also see that I'm painting a bit here with uh, some gradient, not just completely black and white, but sometimes going in and just changing some slight gradients because that means that you kind of get some opacity feeling for free, which is really nice if you just want a teeny tiny bit of, of uh, value somewhere. Yeah, and just switching between, you know, your mask colors, whether it's black or white or whatever it is, just quickly allows you to add stuff and, and subtract uh, color. Yeah, it's very handy. Yeah, so the general approach is going to be, you know, block in the majority of the colors using just pure fill layers. And then on top of that afterwards, then we're going to go over with um, with an actual paint layer and then just blend it all nicely together. Though you don't really have to do that. That's just if you really, really want to control everything. But you could also stay very procedural when it comes to this. Yeah, the dirt brushes are just really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth experimenting with some of these because these are the ones I prefer. But... Maybe maybe you don't like them at all. Because this is a painting workflow I've developed over years. So, you know, maybe some th I just have some weird preferences. <laughs> <laughs> Might be. It's often like that we've been doing CG for some time, or we've been doing a field for some time. You get you get some weird habits. Yeah, and then you start talking to students, and they go, why do you do this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you can do that. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of what software you're using, if you're using paint or a C brush or whatever it might be, like the technical implementation would be different, like, but the, the, the fundamentals knowledge is the same. This is an approach uh, I developed while painting in ZBrush. And then I used a bit of Mari as well. And then uh, also for just digital painting, but then just translating the technique into painter. Mm. Like when I'm painting in, in ZBrush, as it's technically different and pretty terrible for, <laughs> for actual texture painting. Uh, in terms of layers and features, um, you don't really paint with layers there. You just have no. everything on one. So the way I would do it was pretty much the same approach as this, just far more destructive. I feel I, I always feel like when I use layers in ZBrush, it breaks my, my paint yeah. for some reason. Yeah, it's really bad. But I, I really I really like the hand-painted feel there. Yeah, I, yeah. Sometimes I'll do like a just a super quick grunge map there, just like blocking everything in and then bring that into Mari and, yeah. uh, and Painter afterwards. The cool thing about this approach as well is that since we are just painting on wood masks, if you want to change um, the color afterwards, like, oh, you want to make this to make be slightly more green or whatever it might be, you can totally do that because it's just on a fill layer. And now we're just adding a bit more yellow into it. This is this is getting more subtle. By far the most prominent one is, um, is, the, um, is the, the red. Yeah, and like what we talked about before as well is that you know, when you have the bony landmarks and, and, and things that push against the skin more, that's, you would have less red there because there's not as many uh, blood vessels and there's not, a less, not, a, not as much blood underneath the skin. It's just there's just not a lot of, not room for it. Yeah. So that, that's why you can see it's pretty clear now that where we're adding yellow right now, that is where there is bone. Yeah. Like you wouldn't add a lot of yellow into the ear, for instance. 
and this is this in general is is an excellent approach to texturing where you're just building it up uh, one fill layer at a time yeah. um, instead of trying to squeeze everything into one map or like or one layer this just keeps it like e even though you know this isn't actually procedural because it's still hand painting but it gives you an element of, of being able to stay procedural even when I've been doing this for film as well, where we clearly need more resolution than what we have here. Like when, I, when I've been doing that, then you do a lot of projections, like photo projections, just to get all that variation. But I'll also do this on top as well. Because what you get from photo projections is you get a lot of variation. But you might get, you might not have, it might not feel coherent. Like you might have some some dinosaur skin, which is red, <laughs> and you have some elephant skin, which is just gray. So a lot of times what you want to do is you kind of want to use that as a base, just saturate that a little bit, and then go over and hand paint in the color variation like this, because then you really get the best of both worlds. Then you get the, um, the control of hand painting it, and then you get uh, the variation from the photos. But we aren't using any photos in this. This is a, it's a note. The yellow can really add a lot of variation into it. And you probably want to ex exaggerate this a little bit in the beginning. Because what happens is everything kind of, it just becomes more even as you go along. In the beginning, you have the, all these like big ground ideas of <laughs> stuff. And then you're seeing like after 200 hours of painting something, you're like, where did all the interest go? Now it's yeah. just flat and boring. So the stronger you can start off with, the better it is. Yeah, and the same thing goes for like when you're actually rendering and once you have lighting information on top, that tends to wash out a lot of what you've actually done. Really so sometimes you just have to go a little more overboard than you think. Yeah, even now when now we're painting in just the, the base color view, the moment you switch this to the material view, it's uh, like half of this is going to disappear instantly. Yeah, right now this looks kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's add some blues as well. The blue adding blues is, is really interesting because it it just makes it feel more dead in the areas or more cold. But but the contrast between the cold and the warm from the reds can really just make it feel come a lot more to alive. Yeah, because it's such an intense color, yeah. uh, contrast wise compared to the reds, especially. Yeah, it's really interesting when you start color picking faces. And that's what we looked at like before when we we're looking at XYC and and all these like properly graded photos and polarized photos, like how much color variation there actually is. Mm. It is quite tricky though when you're painting with this workflow where how do you separate out a reference? Because if you're if you're painting just in one layer, you can almost just color pick one area of the photo and just replicate that one to one. But with this method, you kind of have to analyze the photo and and block out where is the red because now we're painting only red where's the blue because you're painting only blue so it's a really good exercise to really learn how skin is built up because if you're just taking a photo and just projecting onto it yeah you're gonna get amazing textures and there's definitely a merit to that as well because sometimes you just need amazing textures but a lot of time you you really just need to to learn how to do it yeah yeah i mean because you can't rely on projection for everything unless you are Straight up doing a digital where you have polarized yeah. photos from a photo session or something like that. Having the knowledge that you gain from, you know, analyzing references like this and then trying to hand paint it just, you know, gives you a better grasp on how you would actually go in and maybe fix some of those photos that you need to reproject and fill in some of the details. Yeah, exactly. This is like a foundational skill we're talking about where, I mean, I would still use this in production, but it really is like a... a it's kind of like understanding anatomy when it comes to sculpting. You might use a pre-made base mesh and scans and all that, but it's a really, really useful skill to have. Yeah. Like I've, I've textured a fair few digit doubles and uh, there are areas where, you know, you, you're just projecting your textures onto it, but there are areas where, where the projection doesn't work. And then you either got to clone it out using the clone tools or you just got to paint it. And um, I find that a lot of times actually just hand painting it from scratch is a lot better because then you control it fully. Yeah. And if you use this method here, then you can also get all the variation in uh, as before. If you're just using soft brushes, then you're never going to get any variation in there. But if you're using these kind of nice grunge brushes and you're you're building it up layer by layer, like you 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 literally can't tell which areas I'd, uh, I'd hand painted and which ones I projected. I love this combination once you start, you know, because obviously the blue color looks pretty intense just on its own but when you start mixing it just slowly with the red color you get that really nice damaged skin look a little bit with the red and the blue yeah, mixing. Really do. and also keep in mind this is after 14 minutes as well so it's this method is just really fast one yeah. i mean it, it might take some time to get the hang of it if you can't follow along one-to-one -one with this don't worry about it just you know try a few times 
I mean, it, this is like the third time I think I painted this this character from scratch. <laughs> but the third time was quite fast. But what we did was um, I, I would paint something, then Morton and I would do like a feedback round on it, and then just get closer and closer yeah. to the point where, you know, the first time you're spending four hours and it looks kind of crappy and the second time you're spending two hours and it looks better and then it's the third time you spend like an hour and it looks it looks way better than the yeah. first time one thing to keep in mind here is that you know the the reds they they sort of breathe life into the skin color uh, the more yellow and blues that you use the more and more dead the skin is going to start to look because that sort of washes out a lot of the a lot of the actual blood that's yeah. underneath the skin 100 percent so that's something you you gonna have to keep in mind. Also here that the, we're using symmetry and uh, that's uh, problematic because uh, <laughs> the mouth isn't symmetrical. Yeah. But it's interesting now we're getting to that point where we have, it's not that we've painted in shadow or dirt or anything like that, but because the values that we're using for the reds and the blues are darker compared to the skin, it naturally gets that sort of, curvature it's almost like a little curvature map yeah. in there so you can actually start to paint more and more in the in the base color view without really needing to go into material view yeah, exactly you can, yeah because you, you can see the clear curvature of yeah it yeah now. that's also one of the things when it comes to to painting that ideally when if you're sticking to this pbr workflow and the color uh, like just the color slot here should be as clean as it can be no shading information whatsoever but in reality, it can actually be quite nice to paint in some shadows, like add some slight ambient inclusion to it, or just make some of the, the crevices just a bit darker, some of the highlights just a bit brighter. Because mm. it's, yeah, from a physical point of view, it might not be correct, but it, it just looks a bit better. You're just helping the shapes read a bit better. It's like, um, we always do this when we're sculpting as well. If we're sculpting a face, it's very rare that we'll actually use a you know, a real eye or whatever that sort of oh, it's made, has the sclera or like the cornea, everything's on top, perfect iris with a lot of detail. Most of the time we'll just like take a sphere and, you know, poke a hole in it. <laughs> yeah. It's not realistic at all, but it, it captures the light. So, it, you know, it conveys what it needs to convey. It's the same thing with the textures. They don't always need to be one-to-one -one with real life. Sometimes you can make decisions on the fly that actually makes it look better. Exactly. Think of it as like makeup. When you're doing makeup, you're doing highlighting and contouring. Like that's not physically correct based on a clean albedo, but you're not, I mean, clearly that's, it's still in the real world, so yeah. you can do it. But it just means you, you can totally cheat when you're, you're painting textures like this. Yeah, I remember that really surprised me on, I was working on Harry Potter, um, Fantastic Beasts, and um, I can't remember her name. Lenny Kravitz's daughter. Zoe Kravitz? Yeah, she was yes, in it. I was doing the digi double for her. And her face was... Like, there's oh, there's a lot of makeup on her face. Uh, which made it really hard to figure figure out... Like, I had a pretty uh, lower sculpt or, or scan of it. So, like, trying to recreate it. And trying to figure out what her features actually looked like. Because she was wearing makeup. It's really hard to gauge... You know, how deep does the eyes actually sit in the skull mm. and how far up are the brows? Because all, everything gets augmented um, once you put makeup on. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's even like, even with a character like this who probably wouldn't wear makeup because, you know, he's an old rugged dude. But that doesn't really matter because no. you're, it's like if you were to make him for Game of Thrones or something like that, you, you know, you have a real clean Londoner who is coming in there and, you know, he's like <laughs> mid 60s or something like that. You know, the, the makeup crew would sure as hell put makeup on him. Yeah. You're being like, you haven't seen sun ever because you're an actor. You know, go, you, we're not going to damage your skin. We're just going to, you know, put makeup on you. I mean, everyone you see on screen, doesn't matter if it's for a TV show, uh, like a talk show, a film, everyone wears some kind of makeup. Yeah, even if it's just to make the highlights less intense on you, yeah. just so you diffuse the highlights a bit. Like, yeah. There, I, would, I don't think there is anyone on TV. Yeah, you know, powdering is like the most common one. Everyone gets powdered before they go on screen because they don't want it to be like like blinding people with, <laughs> yeah. like because you have greasy skin and stuff. This is quite a nice brush as well, the, the spot spray. It just really adds some nice mm. spots and it sprays it on, hence the name spot spray. It's also nice just to add a little bit of variation like that because if you stick to one brush too much, then you can start getting into that tiled, repeated mm. look. Um, fairly easily. 
Yeah, I also find sometimes with older people that it's almost like their lips bleed a little bit into into the surrounding areas. I'm not sure how physically accurate that <laughs> is, but I, f I find that you can get some nice appeal yeah. on that. Like if you want like a really appealing character, I would make the lips quite soft or sort of uh, quite quite a hard quite a hard line. But if you want something a bit more a bit more grotesque, maybe you want to like almost like you smearing lipstick across. Mm. And now you can see we're just going across some of the different layers as well. We're back to the red layer and, you know, just, just going over it. And you can see how how insanely high res you can actually go or how, or how detailed you can actually go just by using this technique here. Just by adding the spots all around it. And you really want detail here because we're saying, like, you they're going to disappear the moment you go into shaded view. And even with the shaded view now, and just in a material view, this is without any bump or any kind of speck on top as well. That that's going to disappear almost entirely. It's so disheartening when you paint the most beautiful color map and it's so good. <laughs> and then you see it in shots with motion blur. And yeah. We did that when we painted Doomsday for Batman and Superman, where um, we, um, you just, you're just painting this immaculate color map. It took like two months to paint or whatever it was. And you see it in shots and you're like, it was, it was nighttime. It was super <laughs> specky. We, there was a lot of sculpting on top as well to enhance the texture maps and you, you basically can't see colors yeah like if you were to look at the actual for the movie and looking at the color map it looks like uh, it's like painted with a soft brush and then there's only like nice uh, specular breakup with the, the, the roughness map and um, and uh, the actual sculpted skin i mean most of the time for nighttime shots when you've got creatures you don't actually need a color map no you can handle everything with bump displacement and spec yeah it's so interesting when you see examples of that uh, and one of the reasons for that is like if you were to if you were to take a photo and turn it into black and white it still reads as a character yeah but if you were to take away all the wrinkles of the character all the pores and all that it would look like a low-res game character from the 90s it wouldn't look like a character at all so I mean, while this is a hand painting skin for painter tutorial and we you know it's all about the color map in this one you you really need to be aware that the speckler map and particularly the bump map as well is going to be massively influential. Yeah, but yeah, the focus here is more it's really more on the color theory because this is like the foundation. And I'm having so much fun with this kind of stuff. I'm just really <laughs> enjoying painting painting this. But skin is also skin is an interesting thing to paint because it is it's it's quite challenging to get skin to look just right because there is so much variation in it. Yeah, and keep in mind here as well that, or just notice that we we aren't using black and white as as actual colors, we're using them to, for painting the mask. But we don't, we're not making the um, the shadows darker by adding black and making no. the highlights brighter by adding adding white to it. That's oh, here you can see actually nice highlighting, just adding like some nice highlights to make to make it pop more. But you might add some like blues, some brighter blues or some brighter yellows or oranges or whatever it might be to make highlights. And then maybe some darker reds to add shadows. Because if you were, if you're painting shadows in with, or darker areas in with black, that is the surefire way to make it look dirty. <laughs> like it's going to look like you have mud on it or something <laughs> or it's incredibly unappealing. That's why I like picking out the skin tones like we did in the beginning, uh, just it helps you because it, it, it like in one way it restricts you so you don't go crazy but mm. also makes sure that you don't make up things that don't really exist yeah or like that's not how it would look yeah i, I really prefer getting like the the palette first of colors because yeah. now it's it's all about now, now we kind of solve the color issue now the rest is simply like how do you how do you make it work yeah i mean you can mix those colors in like an infinite number of ways yeah. uh, but if you just you know stick to the plan and you know, you, you know your, some anatomy and how to distribute some of the blood and the fat and, and what's underneath the skin, then it becomes easier and easier. And if you have these four colors, you can paint most things. Like there really isn't a whole lot, and at least if you're painting a vocation character, like there really isn't a whole lot you couldn't paint. You can adjust it a little bit here and there, but you have, you have most of the things. It's yes. interesting when clicking on and off the layers just to see like it actually makes quite a big difference when you blend it together. Exactly. And now you can see that it was too, too strong because it looks too sick. 
but that, and that's what I mean. Now I'm going over and being like, oh, but now it's too it's, it's too much. But maybe if you're looking in the material view, maybe you would see that it's not too strong. In this yeah. case, it is a bit too strong. But it, this is always what happens. You start off, you start off strong, and then you you blend it all together. Always zoom out as well. You, you definitely got to work close up as well, but you, there are, you have to zoom out to see the big picture. Yeah, that doesn't matter if we're painting, we're sculpting, we're modeling, whatever it is. This is common technique and it also makes it hard to do, um, like speed up the footage sometimes. Yeah. It gets a little bit epileptic. <laughs> but yeah, I think that just about wraps up this first painting chapter. Hmm?